Hello and welcome to a very, very special episode of the Successful Mentalist podcast. My name is Ashley Green. As always, I'm joined by the fantastic co-host that is Aidan O'Sullivan, but that's not who else I'm uh, I'm really joined by today because we've got someone very, very special, don't we, Aidan? Uh, honestly, I, this is an interview that I am really, really excited to see. Um, now, you'll have guessed from the title, we're talking to a chap named Eric Edmeads. Now, Eric... We've been following for a little while now. We, I first came across Eric on the Mind Valley platform, and honestly, since then, I think I've become a little bit of an Eric addict. In that, I just Eric is one of my favourite people to actually watch, listen to, and honestly, I'm, I'm sitting here looking at Eric as he's uh, smiling away at me as I'm saying this. But this conversation has been long awaited, and I'm, I'm really sort of keen to pick Eric's brain and everything. But with that said, I feel like we should just actually bring Eric into the mix, and then. We'll, we'll tell you who Eric is in that sense. So, Eric, welcome to the Successful Mentalist podcast. Hey, thanks very much for having me. It's going to be fun. It's it's so good. So, I think it's worth saying from the get go that you're actually our first non official magician in the sense that you, you're not you're not a magician by trade. That's not your specific job. Um, so, I, I do really want our listeners to know who you are before we get stuck into why this conversation is going to be so important. So would it be possible for you to give us like a little rundown in terms of who is Eric uh, um, and sort of what you've achieved so far? Because it's fantastic. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I guess the short bio is I was born in South Africa, raised in Canada. And in my early 20s, I moved to England and I started a business in the West of England that did mobile computing and barcode scanning and inventory management. My clients were people like Debenhams and JD Sports that you're very familiar with in the UK. And um, I sold that business. And uh, in that window of time, I, uh, I became fascinated with uh, public speaking. I had been terrified of it for most of my life. I mean, terrified of it. And um, I overcame that and started experimenting with a little bit. And then I sold my business. And, and I actually just went on vacation for two years. Uh, I, I found out that you can buy these round the world plane tickets. And I, over the space of two years, I used six of them. And uh, so, you know, circumnavigated the planet by jet six times. And it was uh, a really great opportunity to, um, you know, for self-exploration. But also, I, every now and again, I'd, invited to, I'd get invited to speak somewhere. And so I would do a bit of a talk and, 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 and so on. And um, from there, I uh, randomly got invited to a tour of a movie studio in Northern California. And one thing led to another and I ended up buying the studio. And the studio was the original, uh, you'll like the name of the studio, I'm sure you're familiar with it, but it was called Industrial Light and Magic. And uh, you know, it was the original physical studios to ILM and that had spun out some years before. They'd spun off from, from Lucasfilm and I ended up acquiring the studio. And next thing you know, we are doing the most incredible projects. We're doing uh, you know, uh, effects for Avatar and Pirates of the Caribbean and Iron Man and Transformers. And I, it was like a, a dream come true in a lot of ways. It was also a nightmare. It was a very difficult business to be in, but you know, great, great opportunity to learn. And then about seven years ago, I, um, I decided to actually follow that intersection, the ever so important intersection between your passion and your competence. And when you can find where that lines up, sometimes there's real magic to be made there as well. And, and it turned out that I had, I know that I, I had some skills in terms of uh, uh, speaking, storytelling, coaching, and that sort of thing. And so I, I, I delved out into that. In fact, the very first real attempt at that, uh, I, I got this random woman, who I'm sure you're familiar with. And, he, uh, his team asked me to come and teach marketing at, at some of his seminars. And I was like, I don't even know why they would even, I, I couldn't even, I wasn't even a speaker. But uh, one thing led to another. I toured with Tony for a year and a half doing that and just fell in love with it. And um, from there, I've just been teaching business uh, around the world. And I started, because one of my deepest passions has been about um, uh, food, uh, food health, food manufacturing, uh, food psychology. I started a company called WildFit, which I'm sure you're familiar with, published by Mind Valley and so on. And and so that's, that's what I do these days. I live in the Dominican Republic. I'm an avid kite boarder. I have yet to do that at the Isle of Wight because that water is too cold. But, uh, but that's, that's where I am. That, honestly, incredible. It, like every time I hear you tell this story of, of, of you, it just, it blows my mind. And can we just take a moment to appreciate that some of those movies that you, like those franchises that you mentioned, yeah, literally ticking off my favorite. So it's like even better that it's all come full circle. 
Um, Aidan was excited from the moment you mentioned movies because he's an avid movie fan. But like, I think it's brilliant that we've got you here because although like you're an amazing guy, you do incredible things, like you're a serial entrepreneur, like the thing that we got you here to talk about today was in fact public speaking because this is what magicians will really benefit from. And they're so trick focused. It's all about the things they do, the things they perform, but to actually be engaging, you've got to learn to speak well, right? And one of the things I loved what which was just amazing really about uh, a lot of your webinars you do even when you're mentioning a product at the end even when you're mentioning a course even when you're trying to sell something it's so engaging and so interesting even when you're talking about something which you're selling like is there a way in which you just like if you had to name the three best tips to actually have an, an engaging way in which you speak and have a conversation well, I, I can tell you one thing, be excited about whatever it is you're selling. Uh, you know, it helps a lot. <laughs> to, like to, it just does. Like, you know, look, people often, you'll see somebody doing a presentation and they'll be talking and then they'll come to the sales pitch part and they're like, and we teach this and we do that. And now let me tell you about the product I'm trying to sell you. And then they get this whole like, oh my God, and they're afraid and all this kind of stuff. Well, I'm thinking, let's do it another way. Imagine, um, you know, uh, What's that place in Los Angeles, the Magic Castle? Yes, yeah. All right. So, so let's imagine, have you been? Unfortunately, oh, yeah. No. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, but let's imagine, let's imagine that you'd been there and now you're at, you know, an event with a bunch of your magician friends. You wouldn't go like this. And then we saw this and we saw this trick and they guide this incredible illusion and it was just incredible. I, so you should buy some tickets and you should go to the Magic Castle. You, you, you wouldn't do that. You, you would maintain your excitement. If anything, your excitement would grow higher with the invitation where most people let their excitement drop down with their invitation because, well, what? They're afraid of rejection. And honestly, I, like if you're afraid of rejection, there's only two things I can tell you. Either your product or service sucks or there's a self-esteem problem somewhere in there because or selfishness. Because think about it this way. If we look at my company, WildFit, for example, I mean, our, we literally have, we, we have so many cases of say weight loss, type two diabetes reversal, autoimmune disease remission. Like we have so many of those that if I'm sitting talking to somebody and I want to offer them wild fit and I don't offer it to them or I offer it to them half assed because I'm afraid of rejection. Then let's think about this. What that means is, is that my fear of rejection, which is going to last for how long? A few minutes is more important to me than the pain and suffering they're going to experience if I don't get them to do my program. Uh, so, so in all those ways, when you're getting ready to sell something, you should be excited about creating that invitation for the, for, for the clients, in my opinion. And that, that if you're excited, they'll be excited. I mean, that's, that puts so many things into perspective. I mean, I'm just going to straight out admit that for anybody that attends our all about the tricks live lecture series at the end of every single one of those, we announce the next lecture. So, um, if our energy peaks or continues, uh, you can blame Eric at this point. <laughs> <laughs> but um, what, I, what I particularly enjoy about sort of the way that you sort of communicate and you you, you speak with such conviction and, and this energy, it just it sort of blows my mind at the fact that regardless of of the position of anybody in your audience or in your in the group that you're talking to, I mean, I've seen you uh, talking live at something like the um, A Fest stages over in Mind Valley and the actual YouTube videos, like so many people, hundreds, if not thousands of people that are sat there watching you with that complete rapt attention. And what I really want to know, and uh, kind of there's some similarities between the points that you talk about over on Speaker Nation, um, which are like the F-15s and the L-15s, which um, uh, would you be able to give a quick sort of overview of just sort of what the F-15, L-15 is? And then we'll- Yeah, sure. Uh, the F-15 is, uh, uh, it means in a sense, first 15%, but it's a metaphor f that we use for the, uh, based on the F-15 fighter plane. And, and the way it works is this, is that an F-15 going on a short sortie will use half of its jet fuel just to get into the sky. And then once it's in the sky, it actually can coast. Uh, it, it doesn't burn nearly as much fuel. And what I've come to recognize is that the same is true with public speaking. If somebody really nails the start, 
if they really nail a start, then they overcome the insecurity of the audience. And then at that point, the audience will sit back, relax and, and enjoy what's coming, which now means you can relax and coast a little. Now, it doesn't mean you half ass the rest of it. It just means that if you put a, a phenomenal amount of energy into the thought process, the structure and the delivery of a solid F-15, then you will earn the right. You will earn the right to give the rest of your talk free of the doubt of their interest. You know, so like I, I've had people come up to me, I, I, I'll never forget, I was in Copenhagen and this friend of mine came up to me and she's, she's been speaking for 30, 40 years and she came up to me and she says, how do you do that? And I said, what, what, what? And she goes, that, I go, what? She goes, that thing you do where they sit on the edge of the chair and they let their bladders fill up and they don't check Facebook. Like, how do you do that? And, and part of my answer to that is, is that if you nail the F-15 really well at the beginning, then you will create enough excitement and intrigue that even if there are some lulls in the talk, they will have faith in you. And because sometimes when you're lecturing and you're giving information, it's going to be flat, right? So, but if you nail that F-15, you'll earn the right to do that. And then the L-15 is the landing or the last 15%. It's not, the percent is not real. It could be the last 15 seconds if you want. Um, what happens, one of the things that's so very important as a speaker, I imagine the same must be when you're performing in magic. It is really important that you finish on time. Uh, um, when you go over time, you might think that you're doing that out of an abundance of, of, of caring and, and, and contribution and wanting to you know, give more to the audience or something. But the truth is what you're doing is disrespecting all the acts that are coming after you. You're disrespecting the producer who's producing the show. And frankly, you're disrespecting the audience. So ending on time is really important. The challenge is, is that what happens to a lot of speakers is because they haven't really thought about how they're going to finish their talk. They end up like a plane that's circling going, do you see a landing strip? I don't see a landing strip. And they just keep kind of circling around looking for a landing strip. Whereas if you know precisely in your case, what story or, or, or gag or, or, or illusion or trick you're going to finish on, if you know that, well, then it's easy. And the same thing for a speaker. If you know what story or quote or thing that you're going to finish with, then when you see the warning, you got three minutes to go and you know that you, you, you know that your, your thing takes like two minutes, then you know you got about a minute to start your wind down. And then boom, you land elegantly and predictably. And because you're using the same ending each time, you get to measure little tweaks on it. You get to measure it and go, wow, when I did it this way, but I left that pause, I got a stronger applause. And so you can, you can more scientifically test it because you're using consistency. Yeah, that makes so many, so many clear points. I think for, for our listeners, you'll be able to sort of piece the dots in terms of like the similarities between these F-15s and L-15s to our opening routines or opening tricks, openers and closers. It's, it's the two things that from myself and Ashley's perspective, like, the community at large is so obsessed over making like the best trick at the start and also making the, the best trick at the end. And that's kind of where we prioritize. And I guess sort of from a first sort of surface level perspective, like you're saying that that's a good place to focus on to, to start a show in that sense, perhaps. Yeah. It's just, I mean, and you know this, right? You, you don't really necessarily want to start with them. It, it, okay, look, it depends. If you're doing street magic, if you're performing in Covent Garden, then you want your first gag to be truly monumental. You, you want it to make noise. You want a huge applause. You want that crowd drawing attention that's coming in. And so you have to reverse things when you're doing street magic. But if you are in a theater, then I would recommend that your first uh, act, as it were, is actually designed more to settle them down and create intrigue for what's coming next, rather than to blow their minds right away. And, 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 and part of the reason is, is that we, in speaking, we talk about using something called the charisma pattern. And that means that you recognize that there are some people in the audience that are more visually attuned and some people are more auditory in their processing of information. And many people are quite kinesthetic. And people who are very kinesthetic don't like loud. They don't like fast. So if you start loud and fast, you potentially turn those people off and, and enough that they might leave uh, or disengage and look at Facebook or whatever. And so when you're doing a public presentation from a storytelling perspective, we suggest that people start kinesthetically, warm auditorily, and then take them to visual heights. And then once you've done that once, you now can run all the way through that, through the course of your talk or the course of your presentation. And I would suggest that that, that, that rule applies 
in any number of areas. I, I know it applies in music. I mean, if you if you take a look at a um, at a song like, um, uh, well, I'll why don't we just go British with this one? Let's take a look at a song like Stairway to Heaven. I mean, if you were to fast forward to the eight minute mark of Stairway to Heaven and play that song for somebody for the very first time, roughly 20% of people would like it because they like heavy metal and they like rock and roll, but the rest of them would be instantly turned off by it. it it's just too fast and it's too loud. But nobody is turned off, unless now it's because they've heard it too many times, but nobody is their very first time turned off by the opening sounds that come out of, out of Stairway to Heaven. Nobody. Nobody is. It, 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 everybody can relate to it, and then it warms up. And at the beginning, Robert Plant sounds like he has the voice of a teenage angel. And by the end of it, it's like, and as we wind on down the road, and he's like shouting at the top of his lungs. And you're like, same vocalist? Yeah. And, and, but everybody, and by the way, number one requested song in the history of radio for a reason, because it powers this, it uses really effectively this charisma pattern. And I suspect that the same thing you'd find would work in doing a, a show that start with something that's great, but that creates more intrigue than immediate mind blowing. That is just beautiful. And, and I can already identify so many problems in the magic community where, where people have done that, where it's, they've come out and they've, They've got a strong start or what they thought was a strong start, but it's like, bang, it's like, especially like uh, in a close-up set. And it's like, they go in like immediate energy. It's like, hey guys, let me show you this. And then they're like setting fire to like some flash paper, which is like big flames everywhere. And I've seen so many times where people just go, <laughs> like, too much <laughs> kind of thing. Yeah. Do you so think it, just, 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 just quickly on that, in terms of like, like a close-up pers like perspective, do you think that actually maybe that's, like we, when we go to a, a group with the energy to go and like perform something like a residency or something that perhaps like we get this sort of jarring vibe because we're trying to to do something so so fast and um i mean that probably doesn't make sense at all but the idea that when you, you when you're going to a group you go to that group confident and with the energy and with the like the, the keen desire to actually perform for the group you think that might be sort of some of the reasons that people switch off and say oh no thank you I, I absolutely I'm, I'm going to be I'm going to a little off color here but if you were to think of your show as more like a sexual uh, experience um, then you would choreograph it better but you see what happens when I've you know, look I, I've, I've, I've seen lots of performers over the years often opening for me at events and that kind of stuff so I, and I've got to see it pretty close up and if you come in and you're all excited and eager and you want to like go fast and hard right away well does that work in either situation? No, you need foreplay. And, and I'll tell you something, I would rather see a mediocre magician who is very engaging, entertaining storytelling and, and, and connecting with the audience than a fantabulous you know, trickster who can do great tricks, but doesn't fill the blanks that, that, that there's no, that there's no uh, warm up and there's no, there's no thread of continuity. I'll tell you the very, the very best magic trick I ever saw wasn't a magic trick at all. It was uh, a speaker, Andrew, I can't think of his last name right now. He's, uh, he's based in Singapore. He writes all these books like on being happy. They're like cartoon, cartoon personal development books and um, really good stuff. He gets on the stage and he says, listen, you guys all want to achieve great stuff in your life. But the thing is, you go too big. You know, you, you, you go too big too fast. He says, sometimes you got to start small. He says, I moved here to Singapore. I decided that I would, I would try to learn Mandarin. Now, I didn't know what I was getting into. I mean, that's, that's too big. And you go, you, you realize it's a, it's a language too far. You know, it's, if I want to learn French or, or German. If, I want to, if I'm English and I speak Spanish, I already speak 400 Spanish words. Like anybody who speaks English already speaks 400 Spanish words. It's really, you know, but with Mandarin, he goes, it's a little different. So, you know, you start off like ni hao, ni hao, you know, and, 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 then, and then one day you learn, oh, share, share to sing. And, and he's doing this as he's going along. But then as his talk is going, he's dropping in more and more Chinese. And remember, this is a, this is a Singaporean audience. So they all speak, they speak three languages. They speak English and they speak Chinese and they speak Singlish, you know? And so, so that means that as he, as his talk goes on, he, he's at the initial 0% Chinese, then 10%, then 15. And he finishes the talk in perfect, flawless, unaccented Mandarin. And it's the most phenomenal magic trick you've ever seen because he creates the illusion that he learned Chinese on the stage right then. It's phenomenal. 
Hi guys, it's Ashley Green here, and I just want to very quickly interrupt and sneakily butt in this incredible podcast. If you haven't already guessed, public speaking is so needed to improve your magic and mentalism careers. So you guys, we've actually got something which you can download for free today, which is massively, like I said, going to improve your magic and mentalism careers through public speaking. Aiden, can you tell us more about, and if I haven't said it enough, this free and amazing thing which people can download today. What is it? Where can people find it and where can they absorb all of this wonderful information so eric and the wonderful team at speaker nation have put together a 13 page pdf called the stage effect and in short it's a powerful mini guide to helping you use public speaking and the art of performance skills and presentation skills to improve grow your business which again is invaluable for us as entertainers Now, actually, in this PDF are five really powerful keys to help great delivery within your public speaking. And I know that myself personally, I've got an awful lot of value out of this PDF. It's one that I keep revisiting every single time I'm preparing a new talk. And you guys can download that completely for free today simply by checking the link in the description or the caption of wherever you're watching or listening to this podcast. Again, completely free 13 page PDF provided by Eric and the wonderful team at Speaker Nation. We know you're going to love it. Anyway, let's get back into the episode. I want to do that now. <laughs> I, want, I want to do that. Step one, learn Mandarin. <laughs> yeah, that's... Uh, this no, just I... goes back to, like, what you said, like, a moment ago, like, setting it up so, like, people are, like, interested in what's going to come, right? And, like, yeah. setting an interesting premise all throughout. And... I'm really interested to ask you this question because obviously we've identified like the things people need to do so that they can go in, whether it's like street magic or whether it's close out, whether it's on the stage and like have that in and not like hitting people straight away, but making it interesting. Like sometimes people perform and, and this is the problem, like they hide behind the magic tricks and, and they're not confident in going out there and not confident in delivering their strip, their scripts. Like, how would you suggest they deal with that? Because they want to be a professional performer and they want to go out there and they want to entertain, but they're using magic as a way of hiding their kind Okay, of you're on something, you're on something very, like if we can just be bl- brutally honest, um, if, if, if you've got a room full of, of six-year-olds um, the, and they all get given a magic uh, uh, set for their birthday, their sixth birthday, it is the shy introverted ones that are going to become good magicians. And initially, because the other ones are, they might do it and they might get off on it and they might get the cheer and, and, and that could work. But the truth is, is that there's something, I mean, let's be very clear to become proficient in any trick. The first million times you're doing it, you're alone. And so the average extrovert does not enjoy that continual repetitive practicing of a thing before performing it. Whereas the average shy introvert's like, that's an excuse not to be around people. <laughs> then it means that when I can be around the people, it's the ultimate magic trick at all. Don't look at me look at the trick. And so I'm, I'm able to make myself disappear in that, in that exchange. So that is something that has to be overcome. And I've actually worked with a number of magicians on that over the years when they've come to our speaking academy, like, how do I, how do I get out of that? When, and, and so a, a big part of it is, is, is to recognize that one of the most fundamental forms of successful communication is storytelling. It, anytime you're able to tell a story, you, 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 I mean, one of the great illusions that you can always create with storytelling is the bending of time. Um, if you, uh, you know, Aiden, you've seen some of my talks on YouTube. Uh, have you ever had the experience where you've watched one of them that maybe was like, say, an hour long? And then at the end of it, if somebody asked you how long it was, if you didn't look at the timer, you'd have been like, uh, 20 minutes or four hours. I just don't know. Right. Yes. And, and, and really good storytelling creates that feeling. Right. And so if you really if, if, if you begin to understand that storytelling is itself a tool of illusion, it, it, it is itself a spellbinding. I mean, it really is. When you when you are a great storyteller, you are casting a spell on the audience that's taking them away from Facebook and getting them off their mobile device. And you when you know you've done a really great job, it's when at the end of it, you have all these people like leaving the room really, really quickly because their bladder filled up and they didn't even notice. So, so when, when, when you begin to understand that storytelling is part of the trick, then you, then you just got to come out of your shell and say, all right, jump in. It's part of the show. So I, I've kind of got a quick thought on that because a lot of people, and we've spoken about this before, sort of our shared our sort of thoughts on it, but 
a lot of people, and we, we really believe that one of the easiest ways to tell a story is obviously through uh, creating an emotion and actually being able to sort of bring out an emotion of some kind. But in sort of the magic world, it often turns out that we all tend to, there's copycats a lot in, in magic. And a lot of this storytelling, when people say tell a story, everybody tends to think or opt for, oh, but when my, when my grandfather taught me this first trick when I was young, it changed every, and it's all the same kind of stuff. So is there a way that you think that we can best find a story rather than just copying everyone else? You know, um, I think that anytime you've had an emotional experience in your life, you're in a story. Like that, anytime you're experiencing a peak emotion, you're kind of in a story. And when people want to tell that whole grandfather thing, what they're wanting to do is tell the origin story of a trick or the origin story of their of their decision to enter into the world of magic. And so an origin story is going to be a normal, normal thing. I wouldn't worry about that. I would use it as long as you can tell it incredibly well. If you can tell it incredibly well, like I, you know, I, I can tell you, I, I have clients that go to everything that I offer. Like it, once somebody comes and does say wild fit, they immediately become intrigued by our business trainings and then our public speaking trainings and, and they do, and, and they do all of it, which is, you know, when I first started this and I told people around me, I want to teach health and nutrition. I want to teach entrepreneurship over here. And I want to, I, I also want to teach public speaking over here. And plus we're going to talk about parenting and relationships and stuff in the middle. Like, no, nobody can talk about all of those topics. You can't, you got to pick one thing. Well, it turns out that if you can tell stories really effectively so that they create lots of value for people, they'll listen to just about any story you're telling. And, and so then the issue is, it's more about the how of the story, the intensity of the story, the emotions of the story. So, you know, Aiden, you might tell the story about how your grandfather showed you this trick on his knee. But if you're just going, well, I was sitting on my grandfather's knee and he showed me this thing and I was so inspired. No, no, no. I remember it really clearly. My grandfather was sitting on a rocking chair, which made me a bit nervous because as I was sitting on his knee, I kept kind of wondering, you know, I don't, I didn't know for sure. But then suddenly he started doing this thing and I couldn't, really understand what's going on, you know, like get into the moment, you know, make a, make, immerse the person in so that they feel like they're having the experience. And then, and then it doesn't matter if you're, if you're using a formulaic story, as long as you're not telling it in a formulaic way. I mean, so yeah. what you're saying is really, it's about feeling the emotion yourself so that they can feel it and pick up on it. That's it. If you want the audience to feel, you have to feel. And unfortunately, what happens for a lot of people is, is that the one thing they never want to show the audience is their genuine emotion. I'm like, oh, get over it. I mean, the ultimate strength is vulnerability. And the ultimate authenticity is just being yourself and not guarding all the time. And so if you have emotions about a story, then have the emotions about the story. If you feel them, then you will be like a tuning fork that you hit you, ding! and all the other tuning forks will start vibrating. And that's a really effective story. If you are not feeling as you're telling the story, the odds of them feeling anything are pretty low. Wow. So really, what we're saying based off of that is we've come into this talk, like talking about magic and like openers and like magicians are going to do this and cause like mystery. But really it comes like, and would you say the more important thing overall, magic or storytelling, is it the storytelling that's more important than the actual trick and the thing you do then? Well, let's check it out. Which one do you think can survive standalone in the free market economy? Do you think somebody can, can make a show work entirely only on stories? I think so. Can somebody make a show work entirely only on magic tricks? I don't know. I don't know. It, it, and by the way, maybe they can, but it's few and far between. I mean, just let's just look at stand-up comedians. How many stand-up comedians are there compared to how many magicians there are? How famous are they compared to, you know? Like, it, it, what I'm saying is you figure out a way to combine both things together and you, you are, like, that's it. That's everything. I, I, was, I was at a friend of mine's house. I was actually at uh, Vishen Lakiani's house in Estonia a couple of weeks ago. And he had a, 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 a local Estonian magician coming, you know, there. And the guy's like, hey, uh, Vishen, do you want to do a bit of a trick? And, and they start talking. He goes, yeah. And he, and he starts telling stories about this while he's, uh, you know, while he's setting it up. And you know what trick he's doing. He's doing the spike under the cup trick. And, um, and so he's doing the spike under the cup trick. And he's like talking about it all. And then, uh, and then he's like, um, he goes, uh, Vishen, have you had a couple of drinks? And Vishen goes, I'm not sure if I've had enough drinks to do this trick. Like, you know, it's like, he knows the trick. So now 
he's doing all this stuff, but he's not, he's not like, and this cup and this cup, he's going, yeah, this trick's really fascinating. I got to tell you, but I got to tell you one thing. The other day I got stuck on YouTube and I saw video after video of where people have failed at doing this trick. You do not want to see those videos. And he's telling this story while he's getting Vision's hand putting on the cup. And I, like, I, I'm, I'm sitting there, I know with 99.99% certainty that it's all gonna be fine, but that 1% bloody uncertain made my hands sweat. But it was because the way he was telling the stories made you go, holy crap, you mean this trick doesn't always work? And he just, it was, it was I, I've seen that trick a million times, it's never made me sweat. That time it made me sweat. Oh, and Vision? I got to tell you, Vishen was very, very, the, the first two cups, I mean, uh, he, but, but the weirdest thing is when it finally, like when he finally, when he got um, onto the, 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 the penultimate, like when you now, when it's the final, you're down to two, I think. And, and at, that one, for some, Vishen actually calmed down pretty, not me, not the audience. I don't know what it was that made him look a little calm, but I'll tell you, all of the audience was in. And that's because... Rather than going, well, with this cup trick, we do this. And it's really important that you do this and notice that it's not weighted. And of course, he dropped those things in. But instead, he told this story about surfing YouTube and seeing the cup fail tricks. We, we were in. Well, that just proves the point then, that it's all about the stories and captivating people through that emotion then. Yep. And then the trick will, will, will do well. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's absolutely fascinating. I mean, I'm... I'm curious because at this point we've spoken about sort of the best sort of approaches based on the different situations on how to come out forwards and actually do a trick based on the presentational elements. We've also spoken a lot about the, the story and actually being able to sort of continue that and make sure that sort of every middle point of your show and even start and finish is like every point is the best it possibly can be through the use of these stories and these emotional connections to keep people in the right direction. I do want to kind of get your thoughts on on closing a show. So obviously you've got the L15s that we've spoke about earlier. And for us, this is like the closes. And when we try and do a really big finish, I mean, from our, our perspective, like Darren Brown has mastered this. He is, at, he is the best at closing shows that we've, that we've seen. I'm really curious, are there things that you think best suit like an ending? What, what makes a good ending to a performance piece? Well, one thing that does is the difference between a magic show that is a collection of unrelated um, experiences versus a, um, uh, a tapestry. And Darren Brown weaves tapestries. I mean, that's what he does. Like there, there may be the odd thing inside that doesn't seem directly related to the overall story that he's telling, but then at the end, you actually begin to understand if you didn't already, that it was a tapestry, that everything was intended and everything was stitched together. So if I were, you know, helping uh, um, somebody design a show, I would, I would be saying, okay, show me all the stuff you can do. But now what we want to do is we want to create a tapestry and figure out how the tricks fit the tapestry, right? Like that, that's what I'd be looking. And I think, on, I think a lot of times what happens is that the very, um, the, the focus really is, is can I do this well? Can I, create, can I create the magic well? And yeah, I'm good at this one and I'm good at this one and I'm good at this one. And, and what I'm saying is, okay, that's great. That's your inventory. Those are, those are you know, like jokes. Uh, they're like jokes, but you know, hey, look, it's no different. You've all seen the comedian who just does joke after joke after joke after joke. Compare that with Robin Williams who tells a story, right? And the story is full of humor and jokes. And by the way, the story would be interesting even if he didn't put the jokes in. Now you're talking about magic. Like if, uh, if, if it were me, if I were working with you to design a, a show, what I would do is say, all right, show me all the stuff you, you can do. And then I want to talk about some life experiences you have. And I'd like to talk about what the general theme of your, of, your, of your show is. And by the way, what are your strategic objectives? What are your objectives with the show? And, and I would guess that most of your tribe their strategic objectives are something like, wow, the audience, earn my fee, uh, maybe, you know, get a few followers. Like, that's about the extent of the strategic objectives. Those are, never mind. When I'm walking on stage, my strategic objectives, I always have a primary objective. That is what I've been hired to do or what I'm there to do. So if a producer brought me in to perform, primary objective is blow the producer's mind and over deliver. 
That's it, primary objective. But then I'm gonna have a realm of strategic objectives, which might be pick up more social media followers, get a book deal, get a TV deal. Like I'm thinking about that stuff before I walk on the stage. I, I get invited to do my next presentation. In your case, it should be get my next booking. You know what'll happen, by the way? I'm sure you've seen this. When you first start out, you're not good enough to get invited to the next booking. So you do your booking, people go, yeah, it was pretty good, but they're not like compelled to bring you to their wedding, right? Then, then you get good enough where they're starting to go, my God, could you do this birthday for me? But then you get so good, they don't even ask anymore because they assume you're untouchable. Now, you know, like that's what happened. It, 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 the same thing happened to me. I got to this place where I, every talk I ever did would always lead to the next invitation. So I was, I never, I've never had a PR firm. I've never had an agency. I've never had any of that stuff. It's just one talk led to the next talk, led to the next talk. Um, but then all of a sudden, I, I, I just stopped getting some of those invites and I stopped getting podcast interviews and all this kind of stuff. And I'm like, what the hell is going on? And what had happened is a bunch of my videos had gone on YouTube and quote, celebritized me for that audience, not, you know, celebritized, but for that particular audience. And so they would make assumptions about my availability. So now that I know that one of my strategic objectives would be to create the opportunity to do more interviews or to do more talks, don't I want to drop a story in there? So if I was a magician, I'd be like, yeah, you know, it was really cool. I got invited. I was going up to Manchester to do this thing. And one of the things that I've learned to do is book an extra day to stay around and see the town because there's always people in the audience that sometimes want to do interviews for the press or want to talk about another event they've got. And if you leave, you miss out on those opportunities. So, so I do that. Now, you, you just throw that as a throwaway comment, but anybody in the audience who is thinking, ooh, I'd really like to interview this person or ooh, I'd really like to book this person now knows that you're actually available even though you might be quite famous. So when you look at your strategic objectives, it allows you to now really think about the tapestry. So, so you look at what you're trying to achieve with it. And then once you figured out what you're trying to achieve with it, you think about what the overall theme you wanna create is, and then you form an experience. And the more, in my opinion, the more uh, singular you are about the overall experience rather than the individual moments, the easier it is to come up with a really compelling landing. That's, that's brilliant. And I'm so glad you confirmed one of the things I'm doing in my show at the moment. So I got an online show I put together. And my main aim with that is, well, one of the aims is once obviously, you know, this plague that we're in at the moment disappears, and we can go back and do unusual events, my bread and butters in weddings. So I'm, I'm actually telling a story about like a past wedding and I've built that into the show and I tell a funny story about some guy who was at a past wedding and then subtly the aim is there, but I wanted to like make people aware that, oh my God, this guy does weddings so that they can book me. And I'm so glad you said that because I'm like, yes, it's in the show already. Yeah. And I would go a step further at this point. The minute you book your first 2021 wedding, the minute you book it, I would make sure you drop a story in about that. So guys, it, it looks like I, I just booked my very first wedding. Of course, I'll take care of them if there are any issues with social distancing and stuff. But but it, it's really exciting to be, I'm really looking forward to getting back out to my, and no, I can't tell, there's no crashing allowed. You, 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 you're not invited. But I, like, you know, uh, th then there's people going, oh, he's taking bookings. You know, so you start to think beyond the experience. And, 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 and often something like that is just a 15 second giveaway inside the talk, right? But that one hook can create all kinds of, of, of um, you know, magic for you. It, it, the ending thing, it's very different. Much of what w I would do on stage or a comedian would do on stage or a magician would do on stage, I think the, the, um, the uh, L15 or the F15 and, and, and the storytelling and all that stuff, I think very similar. Endings are a little bit different. And I think that in the case of doing something uh, in, in the world of magic, I think that there you are looking for your penultimate wow. And that's not necessarily always the case um, with, uh, with comedy or with storytelling or what have you. You guys are looking for that big thing to finish on. But I'll tell you, the more that thing is part of the interwoven rest of the story, the more, the more mind blowing it is, the more it look, it, the more it shows that it was intentional, the more it shows that when you, when something didn't work over there, the way it, it actually was, you know, it just, it just ties it all together. It's one of those situations that, and I think obviously we're using Darren Brown as an example because it's fantastic at it, but yeah, as you mentioned, yeah, because that, he programmed you to do that every time you speak. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Uh, <laughs> if on, in all honesty, it would not surprise me. The man of many talents, but just the way it, I think for those, it gives a sort of a two 
different dimensions to it. First of all, it shows that the show was like, it, it was a good show. And I think from my experience, having that sort of end where it all ties up naturally with the themes and everything that you've just described, it actually, it, it sort of improves the quality of the entire show more so than like, it can be a, a good show with some dips or it can even be a terrible show, but that end, if you can string that through, from my personal experience, I found that that's actually made some of my, my worst shows, some of my audience's best shows. But what I also think as well is that doing that, it adds another sort of level for the people who are really prepared to think further. And there, there are some people out there that just sit and watch a show and they just enjoy it. They move on. That's just some audiences, but there are other audience members that they're the ones that, they commit so much and especially in sort of our world because we sort of we read minds in that sense we sit and actually do something a little bit more interesting than the everyday uh, guy who does like makes a, a card disappear and appear on the wall we've got something else that's slightly interesting but having this and I, I will get to the point I'm trying to make but having this complete direction with that with that tie in it allows those people to to think deeper and gain more respect as uh, of the show of you as a performer and also like they've i would argue that they feel a little bit closer to you as a person because they've got an insight into sort of your brain and the way that that thinks does that does that make sense i yeah it it does i i, I want to give it to you in a maybe simpler way so that in the future when you feel compelled to talk about darren brown you'll immediately think eric edmeads and then you'll use me as the example you'll find yourself doing that quickly and easily without any kind of hesitation or delay because sometimes when you think darren you'll just think eric instead but the point kidding <laughs> but the point here is that um i want you to think of it this way you have content a book you're reading a movie you're watching a tv show a series a show a magic show a public speaker a comedian there are some types of content that you have to push your consciousness through. And there are some types of content that pull your consciousness along. And so if you think about a book, when you have a book that you have to push yourself through, it's almost like your eyes can get tired reading the damn thing. It's like you have to, and then suddenly you realize you've looked at the last six sentences and you actually haven't even read them. You know, like you're pushing your way through this book and it's painful. But if somebody writes a book really well, you know, Jeffrey Archer, for example, like he, he's very good at writing books that pull you all the way through. And so you're, you're like, you're reading and you're like, I really should be getting to sleep now, but you're reading. So I think of every presentation in terms of the push and pull. And my, my entire design is to create a feeling that you do not have to have any effort at all to consume the content, that it will pull you through. It will keep you engaged and pull you through. So Take a look at what Darren Brown's done. He's created a brand for himself where you know that the ending is going to be phenomenal. So he could quite literally put 10,000 people in a stadium in London and he could bore the shit out of them for an hour, but they'd sit there going, yeah, but it's coming. It's coming. He's built the brand. He's got it. Like he, He's built it that the ending is already pulling them through. Now, obviously, it's taken him years, and, and he's very good at what he does to get to that place. But in the meantime, what we want to do is figure out how we can de design our presentations, whatever they are, so that they pull the people through. Now, you mentioned uh, some of my talks at AFES. So one of my favorite talks from there, if I can be so narcissistic as to have a favorite one of my own talks, but I say favorite because it's the one that I get a lot of really deep personal feedback from still to this day, four years later. And it's a talk that I did and, and that Goldcast has since, since sent out to like, again, millions. It's just incredible. But it's a, it's a talk that I did on a concept that I talk about called the hindsight window. We won't go into that now, but what we will do is talk about the F-15. That talk, the background behind it that a lot of people won't know that even if they've seen it is that I had already done my talk for that event. And the organizer, Vishen Nakiani, came up to me afterward and he said, we've been getting a complaint from the audience. I was like, what? And he goes, we didn't give you enough stage time. He says, would you be up for doing another talk tomorrow? And I'm like, I'm, I have to design a 20 minute talk tonight <laughs> to give tomorrow. Like, I don't know what it's like for you, but as a speaker, you want me to speak for three hours? I don't even need to prep for that. I can just show up. You want me to speak for 20 minutes? I need to spend a month on that. Like it's, it's like, you know, what am I? And, and so that morning when I did that talk, it's a talk I'd never done before. I had never, ever done it before. And, and, and by the way, the reason I was doing a talk that I'd never done before is when I asked Vishen, he says, would you do another talk tomorrow? I said, what would you like me to speak about? And, and he says to me, anything you want. And that's what you want. You want a producer that says, 
Aiden, Ashley, whatever you want. That Now you know, you've won them over, right? And so I, I got on the stage, never having done this talk before, never having delivered it before. Um, and, and I opened, and I don't remember word for word what I said, but I opened with something like this. I'm really excited that I get to speak about this topic because it's something I've been thinking about for many years. And I believe that it's a talk that you will remember for years to come. <laughs> like I'm about to give a 20 minute talk and that's my opener. And I didn't mean to make it that strong, but that itself, that claim, as long as I, as long as I deliver is going to pull them through. And so at every junction from the F-15 to the next story, to the next stage, to the next stage, you want there to be this momentum that's pulling them through the experience. And that, by the way, is how you create the illusion of time bending. Because at that point, they're like, I don't even know how long I've been here. Well, they've got something to care about. Like they, they're going into it and like you've approached them and they're, they've they already got that social proof from like the last talk you've done. They're already wanting something. And now you're saying, this is a reason to be interested, right? Yeah. Yeah. Which... It's a beautiful tip. I, I actually heard um, from Vision as well that even though that um, talk was one that you kind of made up, it was actually like, what was it? That one of the best talks at A-Fest? Vision called me about three weeks later and, he, and they, I'd never seen this at conferences. I know all conferences do it, but they don't generally share it with the speakers. But he called me and he said, he go, he said congratulations, Eric. You know, uh, it was your first time ever coming out to A-Fest and your, and your talk was the second highest rated talk of the entire conference. And this is like a there's some, I'm not going to name other names because of the competitive, like, but it, there was a lot of incredible speakers there. And so I was like, wow, I've never, you know, and that was still fairly early in my speaking career. So it was kind of a nice, you know, and, uh, um, and, and, and I said, as I started trying to say, thank you, he, he goes, he goes, stop, shut up. I go, what? And he goes, that was your first talk. He said, your second talk was the highest rated talk of the entire conference. And he goes, you relegated me to number three. But one of the things I really admire about Vision is that there are producers, actually. I mean, if you talk to Lisa Nichols, uh, we've, we've, this has happened to both of us at times. You go speak at a conference and it's being organized by a speaker and they don't, they don't like that feeling. They don't like being, you know, where Vision's view is, he wants to bring world class every time. So his ego isn't tied into that. And, uh, and so he was, he, and by the way, I, then, I think I've now spoken at something like five of the last six AFES as a result of that. That's a brilliant Fantastic. story. I'm conscious that we're getting to the end of this interview, though but I have a beautiful question for you. And it's one that I ask every guest, which has come up and it, it takes a real tangent from what we've been talking about and, and puts it in a real, well, gives you something to give like a completely different spec perspective on for the audience uh, and people listening. And the question is quite simply, we've talked about magic. We've talked about us being mind readers, but magic in general. And you said you've experienced magic and you know what magicians are, you've seen them but what are three things you hate about magic and magicians in general? Three things that I hate about magic and magicians. Well, I don't hate this dislike in the performance, like things that you just watch and you're just like, nah, um, ego, you know, like uh, ego. I, I, I admit, I dislike that. Um, I, I was in a casino in NASA in the Bahamas in NASA on the Bahamas 20 years ago and the guy up there was just so full of ego and and uh, you know i probably coked up to the nth degree and i it was just unpleasant and, and so i don't like that ego that ego thing um i i look i i if you're copperfield and you've got super strong confidence if you're david blaine if you're if you're darren brown and you're you know okay you know are you, you've earned the right to have a degree of pomp about you but even then i'm you know Ego, no. And then the other thing is, I, you know, when you're on stage as a speaker or any kind of entertainer, one of your jobs is to make sure that when something goes wrong, the audience doesn't really know that it went wrong. So for example, if something happens with my microphone, I will immediately switch to a handheld microphone. I will never throw the, I won't go, guys, what's going on here? You idiots at the desk. Like you just go, Hey, can I have a handheld mic? And you grab the handheld mic and you just start talking. And, and the guy comes up behind you and he's working on the pack, like touch, you know, like right there while you continue. Prayer. My job is to make the entire thing seamless. There is one exception to that though. And that is that I think when it, when a trick goes wrong, I, I think when it goes wrong badly enough that everybody knew it went wrong, I would rather see acknowledgement and humor about that. And uh, cause I saw a guy doing an illusion once levitating a, a, a Lamborghini on stage and it was 
very well executed, you know, making the hoop go around the levitating Lamborghini, all that stuff. And I won't, you know, I'm not going to get into how he, I'm just going to say that the hoop didn't work at the back. You'll know what I'm talking oh. about. And, um, and it was obvious. It was not, it was not something you could just kind of gloss over. And at, you know, at that point, I think I would rather some kind of acknowledgement rather than the embarrassment and shame that just makes everybody in the audience feel uncomfortable. Um, it, you know, I think that that's one. And then I don't, a third one, I, um, I don't know. I would just say that, um, uh, I would say that when I see somebody on the dark side of the force, I don't like it. And it doesn't matter whether you're using, you know, neuro linguistics, which, you know, I, I think a great many magicians these days have probably largely because of Darren Brown have, have gone in and studied neuro linguistics and Ericksonian speech patterns, um, you know, convincing language. And I think those things are incredibly powerful. And I think we all have a social responsibility to learn them, if only to defend ourselves against pharmaceutical companies and big food manufacturers, because they use them. But I think I also see them being used... Um, manipulatively and and i you know no, well manipulatively even that's a judgment word because if i if i if i move my pen i'm manipulating it that doesn't mean it what i mean is manipulating it from the dark side of the force and i that you guys you know when, when you make the decision to get involved in magic illusions uh, uh um uh, mentalist type work all that kind of stuff you are basically becoming practical psychologists you we are all more alike than doing the work i do we're more alike than we're not and, and so what that means is you, you probably begin to have a slight edge on psychology. I mean, look, even if you just think about the simple idea of look here so I can do this, even, even knowing that um, it, it puts you in a position where, um, you know, you, you, you can potentially go to the dark side. The, the, can, I, can I answer, can I, can I offer something that a perspective I have about how every one of us can use magic? Like, to truly transform our own lives. Can I do that? Please, please, definitely. Yeah. So if you think about um, a lot of times, uh, uh, um, I don't know the right language. I, 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 I said trick once and then this magician got mad at me for using the word trick. And I, I just, I, uh, when you're doing a thing, all right, whatever, the, an illusion, when you're doing magic, okay. So we know that, that um, there, there's a diversion aspect to what's going on almost always. And sometimes the diversion is physical over here. But sometimes the diversion is like right here. It's like, I'm going to spin a story so, so solid and so good that you will become so focused on me in this given moment that I can do anything I want over here in your, you know? So there's a diversion side to this. Now, the very thing that makes it possible for you to do that is that humans cannot possibly focus on more than six or seven things at a time. And so when you are using a diversionary tactic in order to make something happen in a particular way, you're taking advantage of that deficiency of humans or an incredible efficiency of humans to be able to focus on something very well. So what that means is, is that we all can learn to do the opposite. We all can learn to divert our focus on the various things that we might otherwise be missing because of stuff like mainstream media because of stuff like food marketing and, and, and advertising. So when you are buying breakfast cereal for your children, for example, they are using diversionary tactics to stop you from looking at the reality of it. And they put a big bright thing on the side that says fortified with vitamin D. But of course, what they're not doing in that moment is they're not actually telling you that there's more glyphosate in that cereal than there is fortified vitamin D. They're not telling you that they're diverting you away from that. They're putting a little plastic toy on one side for the child to see, to divert the child's attention. And then they're putting the fortified with vitamin D on the other side to divert your attention. And the next thing you know, you've got chocolate covered frosted sugar bombs in the shopping cart. And, and so, it, it, I think that what we all have the opportunity now to do is to become much more intentional with where we place our focus. And here are some places not to put your focus on headlines. There's almost no point. Headlines are simply marketing there. They are fundamentally dishonest. Just a week ago, the Daily Mail reported in their headline that if you eat one egg per day, you increase your chances of developing type 2 diabetes by 60%. Now, this is a fascinating story for two reasons. One year earlier, the Daily Mail ran another story that said, if you eat one egg per day, you reduce your chances of developing type two diabetes. 
But then on top of that, if you go to the study, right? The, but if you go behind the magic trick, if somebody explains the magic trick to you and you read the actual study that the press was reporting on, what you'll find is, is that the correlation between eggs and type two diabetes in fact did exist in a, it's not exist in men. They don't mention this in the story. You gotta go to the study. You gotta go behind the magic trick. But then, then they go a little deeper if you read the actual study, if you learn the trick. And the trick is this. They were eating eggs as muffins. So you understand, it's, they're using the very same strategy that you use to entertain and, and, and amaze, and they're using them to manipulate and daze. And so what we want to do is learn now how to control our focus, how not to allow it to be diverted by the mainstream media, how not to let it get diverted by manipulative marketing messages and become much more intentional in the way we apply our focus. And then you create incredible magic. And I'll finish it with this a little bit of a rant, but we've all heard the motivational speaker talk about the idea that there's that day you decide to buy a car. And then all of a sudden the day you get interested in that car, that car is everywhere, like a magic trick. And then the speaker always says this thing, why couldn't you see the car before? And I always correct that by saying, you absolutely could see the car before, but you didn't see it for what it was. The day you decided you wanted to buy the Mazda MX-5 Miata, all of a sudden they're everywhere. But they were always, and they were there for years. They were there the whole time. You could see them, but what you saw was cars, not Mazda Miatas. And, and, and the proof of this is very simple. If you couldn't have seen them, you'd have been in a few wrecks by now, right? So what I'm saying is there's all kinds of opportunity, optimism, and phenomenal life ahead of you that is hidden by our lack of focus. When we change our beliefs about the world, when we start to believe that opportunities are aplenty, when we start to believe that life is happening for us and not to us, we start to see what really is there. And, and that's the real magic trick. That is beautiful. And I just want to say thank you so much for bringing it up at the end of the podcast. I think this is something which I'm so, so glad it took that tangent because me and Aiden talk about this stuff all the time. And I think this is something which I know our audience will just be listening to just going like, this is so true. This is so true. So honestly, from the bottom of my heart, Thank you so much for the gold you've shared today. And thank you for mentioning this because this is so useful outside of magic and so useful everywhere. You're most welcome. It's been a pleasure to spend the morning with you guys. Is there, is there anywhere in particular that people can go and find you? Where should we send people? You know, uh, the best place really uh, uh, is Instagram. I, I actually manage my own Instagram. The rest of it's managed by people, but I, I hold on to my Instagram and I, and, 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 and LinkedIn as well are great places to connect with me. Um, if people are interested in specific things, like anybody who would like to become a more comfortable storyteller, more effective communicator, they should go to speakernation.com. Uh, if anybody wants to learn about how to build a business that they, that, that allows them to truly work on their passion or allow them not to work at all, then they should go to businessfreedom.com where we teach entrepreneurship. And of course, anybody who would love help dispelling the unbelievably manipulative and disgusting magic tricks being done by the food industry, they should go to getwildfit.com and we can completely rewrite your relationship with food and transform your experience of life. And I'm sure that Aiden, we can put the links to that in the description because I know well, I knew before this podcast that the information you share in all of those companies uh, is well worth the investment in not only the money, but the time as well that you put into it, because you'll see transformative um, like processes all throughout. Like you, you'll be a different person by the end of end of reading like one thing on there. So <laughs> we'll whack that in the uh, in the comments because I know Thanks. everyone listening will have a massive benefit from that. But honestly, thank you. Thank you so much for being here and thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to talk to a bunch of magicians. You're most, most welcome. It's been a great deal of fun and uh, keep up the good work. And I'm sure we'll, one day I'll get, uh, I'll get, I'll be able to come back to the UK and maybe I'll get to see one of your shows. Done, we are. done deal. Tickets in the post. No, except they're not. On that <laughs> note, uh, <laughs> I've just, just absolutely ruined the end of that. <laughs> no, it's a little spontaneous flubbing. Remember what I said? When you make a mistake, you sometimes just acknowledge it, acknowledge it and see the the authenticity of it. Aiden didn't. He was going in for the L15 and then it was just boom, crash. <laughs> and that was the end. <laughs> oh, dear. Look how much fun we've had with it at his expense. It's, You're welcome. It's, it's so very British, isn't it? It, it was exactly <laughs> that. Exactly that. <laughs>
Oh, well, thank you so much, Eric. Thank you, Ashley, for being an awesome co-host. Thank you, Eric, for sharing your bottomless knowledge. Um, and for everybody else, do let us know. Go, do go follow Eric. Support everything he's doing because, well, you won't regret it. Simple as that. And just one final reminder to download the Stage Effect, the free PDF from Eric and the team at Speaker Nation. You can find the links in the show notes. Thank you so much for listening and we'll catch you again next week.